Hello and welcome to podcast number 43 from the self-publishing formula. Two writers, one just starting out, the other a bestseller. Join James Blatch and Mark Dawson and their amazing guests as they discuss how you can make a living telling stories. There's never been a better time to be a writer. Well, Mark, this time last week we were in our nice little cubby hole that we found in um, Bloomsbury. Look at us on our Apple Watches. Uh, in Bloomsbury and uh, it was it was great little studio but what was fun was to be in person and record a program like it was a proper radio program sitting around a table having said that nearly everything i listen to on the radio i can tell now <laughs> you know the bbc often in manchester and the guests in london and so on so everyone records like this but um we live remote digital lives and uh, this is normally how we connect but i thought it was fun last week and we got some good feedback didn't we on on that we did it was fun it was good to um uh, do it all together and most of the feedback was kind of divided into two camps some people wanted more John Dyer other people wanted less John Dyer so yeah we'll have to sit down and work out how that breaks down whether it's going to be uh, more John or less John well Mrs Dyer wanted more John and everybody else wanted she, less that's pretty much how it broke down and actually she was only being polite she told me afterwards but um, no it's fun in fact John and I will do I think we'll do a podcast interview soon on some of the technical aspects of putting together your website uh, we've learned mm -hmm. quite a lot as we put together the 101 course and as people feedback on what they're struggling with and the bits they don't understand it's uh, given some ideas for a really good detailed podcast for people who are struggling on what your author page should look like and the best ways to approach putting it together so that we'll do that uh, John and I will sit down and do that shortly and that will be out in the next few weeks. Um, in fact, we've got uh, loads of good interviews in the can. We we plotted them out. In fact, I've got I've got in in a very meta way. I've got my whiteboard and I've got a photograph of your whiteboard underneath my whiteboard with stuff. <laughs> but uh, you've plotted out um, the podcast and how it's going to run probably until about March 2017. So um, we've got lots in the end bag. of March. End of yeah, March. and I've got a couple I'm um, kind of waiting to hear back from, um, which might, we might slot in there as well in terms of New Year stuff. So some quite good, in fact, some very good interviews to be um, to be heard later as we press on into the new year. Yeah, good. Look, today's interview is legal, and it's an area that uh, you know they've got, there's so much you've got to to understand and learn about. And we often say that when you're an independent publisher, you've got to think about yourself as being a mini publishing company. So you think about the marketing, you think about um, you know the sales, or you think about the packaging and everything else, as well as writing the book, which isn't a big deal for somebody. Um, but what else does a company do? Well, it does its account, so you've got to do that, and it also does legal. Publishing houses will have a legal department that have in-house lawyers, or if they're small, they might use uh, an external service. So we also need to think about that. Now, we don't want to uh, alarm anybody, and I think we'll, I'll talk to Mark, who's obviously a trained lawyer, after this about what how this relates to us uh, realistically. But it is something to think about, and I think the best value we get out of this interview with David in a moment is uh, partly there's somewhere and someone you can go to with fixed prices to make it a bit simpler for you to approach if you want to get your books cleared but it's a really good interview just to listen to the way that he talks the type of issues that come up with libel and privacy and so on defamation even you know, almost certainly accidental things you may not have thought of and try to take those on board in a gentle way as you you put your book together and one interesting thing is i have changed an aspect of my book as a result of this conversation with david and we'll talk about that a bit more so let's crack on i'm just going to warn you that the the um the sound quality is not brilliant on this interview but it's a really worthwhile interview and worth listening to so uh let's hear from david i um a solicitor that started out doing a lot of work for celebrities suing newspapers and magazines and radio shows and television companies and that sort of thing and um, that's when i knew mark dawson um I saw the error of my ways and left that horrible world and then moved into the in-house side of things. So I moved over to MTV. I was clearing all their TV content for a couple of years. And then I went to work for a magazine company uh, called the Hearst Corporation. And I was um, the lawyer there, one of the, the in-house team there, clearing all their content for them. And then moved on to the Evening Standard and the Independent as their, um, I became their deputy head of legal for editorial clearing all the content for the newspapers, for the standard, for the indie. Uh, decided I needed to make a change and set up my own firm, reviewed and cleared. 
uh, I wanted to bring the in-house legal skills or in-house legal um, advice to people who couldn't necessarily afford big lawyers. So I decided to set up Reviewed and Cleared with the lawyers who've been doing it for years and lawyers who love clearing content for people and love working with journalists and creatives and that sort of thing, but provide it at a rate that people could afford that uh, try to create a law firm where people weren't scared to go to law firms. Uh, you know, I, I, I know that big law firms can be terrifying. So I thought what, what I'll try and do is create this small, small firm that will enable people to get legally cleared, not worry about the legal side of things and do it on a fixed fee so that they can just get their budget sorted and then go off and do what they need to do without worrying about it. Okay, I mean, it, obviously, it's a it's a great idea because I suppose two things occur to people when we think of the legal side of things, and one is complexity, and the other one is expense. It was always expense first for me. Yeah, I always, I, always, I always appreciated how expensive lawyers are. Yeah, and I, I guess it's not top of most people's list when they're setting out on their author career or probably any other career in the media is is to prioritise that money that they're going to feed into the legal side of it, but. No. We should probably start by explaining why it's important and what it is, what that area is, and how it can unhinge you if you're not careful. Yes, I mean, if, if everybody's honest, the, the lawyers always follow the money. It, it's when you start to have a little bit of success that you start to find that not necessarily the lawyers will be there, but people will be there and start saying, "Well, I created that. That you know, I, I, I that you've stolen that from me." I can't believe you said this about me. I can't believe you said this about my family. It's, it's only when, you start, when you're starting out, you just don't think about these things because your readership or your viewership aren't big enough to really cause ruckus outside your small circle of friends or colleagues. It's when the success starts to come that people crawl out of the woodwork and they start to think that they want a lot of it, maybe money, a lot of it, maybe think that they genuinely think that their reputation is damaged or their things have been stolen. Uh, and what we try to do is head that off. Uh, we work with clients. You know, I haven't met anybody who's writing a book who doesn't believe in it. Who doesn't think this is what this is going to be amazing. Some are, some aren't. But it's better that you're at the beginning dealing with it and, and dealing with it for, for relatively inexpensive compared to when it blows up and blows up financially and legally. That's where I tend to see more of the problems where people. And I totally understand it where people say, "Oh, you know, I'm, I'll be fine. It's fine. I'm sure it's fine." And then it turns out it's not fine. That's where the problems start to arise. Can you, can you be specific about the yeah. types of things that are going to get people into trouble? I mean, the, thing, the things I see that they t tend to come up more often than not are defamation, where you're talking about somebody in, uh, who is a real person or you're creating a character that's sufficiently close to a real person. It's a little bit more difficult in the UK. I mean, the defamation laws are a lot more strict in the UK than in the US. I'm, I'm US qualified as well. And frankly, you can get away with a lot more in the US if you're talking about public figures. But defamation tends to be when you're lowering someone's reputation by making statements get about them. And it can be in the most inadvertent ways, uh, in ways that you would never imagine. I remember dealing with one man who made rope mats and he decided he'd sue one of the magazines I was working on because we'd suggested he used a different type of glue than he did. And to us, it didn't seem like important, but to him and in his sphere, it was important. So these little things that you say about people or places or companies or family members or anything like that can come up and bite you if, it's, if you can't prove it's true and if, it, if they feel it's defamatory. Then you've got the privacy angle of things where you know, everybody takes, everyone takes inspiration from all around them. If your Auntie Mabel's got cancer, that's her business. Sometimes people will think, well, Auntie Mabel's happy to talk about cancer, so I'll use Auntie Mabel. I'll use Auntie Mabel as, as a character or as a, a starting point or as a discussion point. And Auntie Mabel realizes she doesn't want the entire world knowing about her cancer struggles. Auntie Mabel suddenly has a, a, a privacy claim against you and your publisher and, any, and, and anybody along the publication chain. And just on the US-UK point of view, so for a US author, of course, their book may well be being retailed. Well, they may well be selling it on Amazon.co.uk, for instance, if they're self-publishing. So does that bring them within the remit of the UK defamation laws? Yeah, I mean, the UK was traditionally known as a sort of um, where everybody came for their libel tourism. If you were being defamed anywhere in the world, you'd come to the UK courts and, and sue you there, sue there because it's 
the, the burden of proof in the UK is different to the UK in that if I, as a publisher, make a statement, it's down to me to prove that it's true. Whereas in the US, I don't need to prove it's true. I just need to show that I had a reasonable belief that it was true. And so, yes, people would come to the UK and use the UK as a libel tourism hotspot. The, the courts have tried to change that. But it's still quite easy to show that you have, a, you know, we live in a very international community. It's very easy to show if you have a reputation in the UK, that reputation can be damaged. It, it doesn't take very much. I mean, there's a couple of trials going through at the moment where a man's trying to prove that he had a reputation in the UK. He shows that a few hundred people knew him and, he, and he's doing quite well to show that that damage is occurring. Yeah. Okay. So in terms of preventative measures, before we get to, um, to uh, the legal services side of things, so when people are just sitting there writing their book at this stage, yes. uh, I mean, every book is inspired by something. I mean, some people are writing, obviously, epic fantasies and stuff that might be quite far removed, but even that will have some inspiration from the real world. My book certainly is inspired by my father's career in the 1960s. So what steps should I be taking, should people be taking? What I'd be thinking about is... is whether it's you or, or a friend, I'd take a look and read it with a new eye. This is what, I mean, this is how I clear. You take it with a new eye and you read it and you think about how the person sitting on the bus next to you would be reading it. How they, how they would think, what they would think of your father, your father's colleagues. Are they identifiable? Would I be able to figure out? Say, for example, you, your father worked for a famous shop, I don't know, at Marks and Spencer's, and he was on the board during a certain amount of time, and you said, my father always told me that everyone on that board was corrupt down to the, their, very, their very being. Now, you don't name any of those people, but it wouldn't take me very long to find out who that board, that board, those board members were within, within a certain space of years. And those board members could also argue we were all identifiable. I'm, people are quite egocentric, so they would all say everybody knew I was on the board between 1966 and 1970 at Martin Spencer's, and now everybody thinks I'm corrupt because of this book. You need to start to look at these things and think, whose lives am I touching here? What facts am I stating here? Can I back up these facts? Are they family myths or are they, are they something I can show? Are they, are they rumors? If they're rumors, is it something I can prove? Is it something that I've shown out? Will those people be affected? Will their circle of friends and their wider circle of friends understand who they are and believe the things I'm saying? And that's, that, that's from the defamation point of view. Then you need to think about privacy. Again, identification is a real key point. You think, would the man on the bus next to me be able to figure out who I'm talking about? If he can figure out who I'm talking about, is this information intrinsically private? Does, does the person I'm talking about have a reasonable expectation that this information should be, remain private? You know, my, my, my health scares, my sex life, my, um, my, hobby, my hobbies, whether they're Max Mosley-style hobbies or whether they're train spotting. You know, these things... <laughs> Privacy. Sorry, it's a bit, people uh, might not know who Max yeah. Mosley is, but he was. Uh, he's, he's, Max Mosley hobby is spanking and um, sort of masochism with with an absolute non-Nazi twist. Uh, yes, which of course, because of his family history, makes it very. He's a, an interesting character, but his um, his father was a notorious black shirt leader, um, pro-Nazi uh, campaigner in the 1930s, and there's his son who had a rather embarrassing episode spread across the British tabloids. Uh, where he enjoyed the company of young women who may or may not have been dressed up in military wear. So we should just explain that because it, it's an interesting legal case. And Max Mosley to this day has moved on from the legalities uh, through to campaigning for press restrictions, isn't he, in yeah. the UK? Well, Max Mosley is the ideal case of sort of looking at how privacy can touch us, really. When I started at Schilling, I'll go further back. It's the introduction of the Human Rights Act, 90, uh, um, and it, you know, the Human Rights Act in the UK gives gives everybody an Article 8 right, which is a right to private life, family life, home and correspondence. And then there's the Article 10 right, which is the freedom of expression, which authors, newspapers, publishers rely on to say, we have a corresponding right to tell this story. When it all began, there was footballers claiming their Article 8 rights, that basically they can sleep with as many women behind their wife's back as they like. And the women were saying, I want the right to be able to tell how good this footballer was in bed. When it first began, the women's Article 10 rights always seemed to trump the Article 8 rights of the footballers. Now, over time, over the course of 15, 15 years, it's gone completely the other way to Mosley now. Whereas, thanks to Mosley, if you're having sadomasochistic... Sadomasochistic. 
sex <laughs> with sex workers behind your wife's back for many, many years. Dress up, non-dress up, we can leave it there. That's all private information. You are entitled to private life as long as there, there's only two ways in which the press can, can sort of delve into people's private life. And this is what I deal with on a daily basis for the magazines I work for. So you have to show that somebody's either a hypocrite or that they, there is a public interest that we all should know about their, their private life. Um, Lord Coke is, is a quite interesting one. That's, uh, this is his nickname. He was the Lord who was uh, in charge of the, the House of Lords uh, Standards Committee. He liked to use his House of Lords money to go off and um, sleep with prostitutes and take coke, hence the name. Now, he, he was interesting because he was a hypocrite because he was in charge of the Standards Committee. But it was also a public interest because a man in charge of the, our Parliament Standards Committee really should we, should, we should know whether he's having sex with prostitutes and snorting coke in their bras. He was the perfect embodiment of those two things. Now, that's what the whole Mosley case was about, with people arguing whether the public had a right to know that he was doing this and whether he was a hypocrite. The public had a right to know argument. The newspaper ran was that um, he was the head of an international organization. The F, is it the FIA, the, the motor racing? Yeah. Uh, they said, as he's the head of an international organization, he should have a, uh, every, all the public should have a right to know what he's doing in his private life. The judge dismissed it, and I think quite rightly. You know, every, every company around the world has public money running through it into, at some point. Um, I have no right to know what the head of Marks and Spencer is doing in fact. Okay. The interesting argument was whether he was a hypocrite or not. As you mentioned, his father was a, a black shirt and a fascist. Max Mosley had always said, I have no truck with my father's political views. I have no care for fascism. I certainly want to disassociate myself from it in, in any way. Now, the newspaper alleged that he was having these S&M sessions with, um, there was a Nazi element to them. They said he was wearing... It was in a, what appeared to be a concentration camp that he was wearing prisoner uniform, that the women were, they were speaking German and that the women were wearing Nazi uniforms. In the few days of um, hearings, the, the, this was all cross-examined. His evidence was, which was accepted by the judge, was that the concentration camps are something not invention of the Germans, they're invention of the British pre-World pre War II. The pyjamas, the prison uniform he's wearing had arrows on, not striped, as in the concentration camps in Nazi, Nazi, Nazi Germany. Uh, the German is a very good language for S and M because of its harsh nature, and that the women brought their own uniforms and they had no Nazi insignia on them. It's a well thought through series of defenders, uh, defences. Yeah, uh, and sort of, if you sit down and think about it, quite logical as well. Yeah. <laughs> all reasonable things that can well I, I, i've never been involved in that world no. but i can imagine they're all reasonable things that well sa can, sadly but, he's right yeah. about the concentration camps because i know from history that they were started by the british in the south african campaigns yes. oh, and, well. so yeah um yeah. so they've they're, they're done their history okay so i tell you what's what's striking me already is it, we talked about the complexity and in my day as a journalist there wasn't a lot of talk about privacy so we had the libel laws drummed into us and Probably 50% of all the journalistic training I ever had was just legal. And I can probably still dredge up the five main defences of libel. But what you've got here, so you may in your book have identified somebody, even by implication, because they were in that position on the board or whatever at that time. Yeah. But you then think, well, okay, I've said nothing libelous about them. I haven't, you know, they're a, they're a character here. They, they act quite honourably. In fact, they come out to be the hero. Yeah. What you're saying is there's another element here, which is actually people might think that's how they behaved. And that's a privacy issue, which I'm not as familiar with, but this is obviously quite an important area. Well, you can also, with the defamation going back to that, you can write something and, and imagine that why would they be upset about it? But that upset can appear from nowhere. Like the chap with the rope, Matt. You, um, I cleared a book about a guy, and the book was about something completely different. It was about a, a Warcraft game. But he, told, he tells in a chapter how he came to the game. He, he had a bit of a lonely childhood because he'd moved around. And the reason he'd moved around was his father and his business, his father's business partner had a falling out. And it had obviously become family myth that the father had been screwed over by the business partner. Now, I had to go back to him and say, okay, this is such a throwaway line. 
but can you prove any of this? Can you prove that this man did these things to your dad that made him move? And he went, well, no, not really. It's just what my dad told me. And so the, the business partner was were absolutely identifiable. It was just throwaway line, but could have led to a lot of problems. So that, that line just had to be removed from the book. And it's, it's not necessarily your main protagonist or not necessarily your main stream. It can be things that sort of flow off it that are accepted myth or accepted just accepted fact without really thinking about it. That they're the things that tend to crop up in books more than straightforward, I'm writing about this, because that tends to be the area of focus that, you know, if you're smart enough to write a book, you're smart enough to get the central facts right. And so you'll say, obviously, you're so everyone wants to be authentic in books. Well, in some books, it's more important than others. In my book and Mark's books, we're, we're really big on authenticity and we'll you know, Mark will get comments from people who used to be in the shadowy side of government business who would say to him, that's actually not quite how it worked and then correct him on things. Yeah. Uh, on the other hand, I'm now thinking maybe I shouldn't, because in my quest for being authentic, I've used a genuine REF station as the base and I've dated it as well. Obviously, I then created a, a unit that didn't exist within it and my yes. characters are members of that. However, the station commander was above all of those units and would be an identifier. And for that reason, I've kept him out of it. I've mentioned the, the person, not by name, just the rank at one point. But I'm now thinking, actually, he would probably have a case to say, you've defamed me because these things were happening on my station, even if it's a made-up unit. I might be safer just to come up with REF Walston Green and just make something yeah. up. Yeah, I mean, he could say, it, it, you know, it, it, I know you don't mean to do this. I know I can, you know, a claimant can come on and say, I know you didn't mean to defend me. It's quite clear you didn't, but people are believing what you're saying. People are believing that you base this on actual facts. I mean, it, what, there's one story where it reminded me there. We were doing a magazine piece about an air hostess who travels around the world, sleeps with pilots, takes coke, has a whale of a time. We had a, a, in a red uniform, a nondescript red uniform, um, and we changed, you couldn't see a face, and we changed her name. They forgot to put a star and asterisk in the gutter saying name change. The name they changed just randomly happened to be a virgin air hostess. Oh. So, the, you know, she quite rightly came and sued us. <laughs> yeah. And I'd be right to sue us because we basically just done a hatchet job on her without any proof whatsoever. Um, these things can sort of crop up like you say in the strangest places if that man's circle of friends or colleagues or ex-colleagues say whoa oh, does this book does this book have a you know has this guy written this book for a reason it, it's a difficult thing. he has to show serious harm to his reputation under the new defamation act it's changed it's a little bit more difficult to sue he would have to show serious harm to cause to his reputation but uh, what, uh, you, you and I know, your know, background as a journalist, these serious harms can appear from the strangest places. And yeah. I, don't, I don't want to come on and scare them under it's not, it's, not my, it's not really my thing. I don't, it's not my way of coming up business. Um, the, the way I wanted to come on is actually just say, just be aware as you're writing every line. What are you saying? Who are you saying it to? What are you communicating? Is this person in the privacy angle? <laughs> you know, privacy is getting really, really tough. It's it's ruining a lot of stories. So, you know, but you have, and, and there's also to, to complicate matters further. People have claimed for false privacy, saying it's not true. But if, even if it was true, it's an invasion of my privacy. Right. And succeeded. Okay, so that is complicated, and, and you don't want to be sued because that's one thing. If anyone's had any legal entanglements in the past, this idea that you can sit there thinking it's fine because uh, it's factual or it's fine because I don't think this is a case of privacy, you just do not want to go down that route. No, I mean, it costs all. You know, I, I, I tried to set up a cheap, uh, I shouldn't say cheap, a, a cost-effective way of dealing it. But even my rates, and you know, I couldn't afford me. I, the, the, I wouldn't want. I'd never want to get into a libel battle, or a privacy battle, or a data protection battle, or even a copyright battle. It's just not worth the time and the hassle. And I've seen firsthand how much litigation can affect journalists who, who aren't going to lose money, but but you know, their jobs in in in, in peril. And, and I've also seen firsthand independent publishers getting in the middle of it, and it can be devastating. Yeah. So. So legal advice, obviously, uh, as you say, is, is tends to be out of reach. We were lucky when I worked at the BBC. We had a team of very good lawyers. There was always somebody um, 
uh, on hand and any time of night or day you'd, you'd make the phone call they'd usually then you'd in those days hold the phone next to a speaker so they could listen to the script and the clips yeah. you'd get a bit of advice and some of them would get with some of them we knew were quite gung-ho about it they'd talk to you a bit about your source and so on and then say go with it and the only thing thing that mattered from my point of view as a journalist is that i took their advice yeah so the big no-no for me was to go ahead with something they'd said do not do because then i'd be in a lot of trouble and even if the bbc did get sued afterwards if he'd said or she had said that's okay so that legal advice um is a very important step but as you say is out of reach these, yes. guys, these guys were probably some of the highest paid, I imagine, at the BBC, and that's saying something because there's some high salaries there. Um, so, how do pe- how does your service operate? How does it how is it accessible to me? For books, I've what I've tried to do because books are quite work intensive, and books can often be twenty chapters of just running through nothing, and then finding one thing, or even finding nothing, which is. But. I've tried to do a fixed price service. I, 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 the thought of lawyers being on an hourly rate is awful. Uh, and when I was an in-house counsel, I would never have a lawyer on an hourly rate because, frankly, it's human nature just to, to push it and, and take the mickey. What I do is I agree a fixed fee, and I, I, I'm quite open to negotiation based on lengths. And what I often do is have a discussion with the author about the book and. And I will be able to give an idea after a 20-minute discussion, which isn't charged. Nothing, nothing's charged until we've agreed to fee. Um, if it's quite clear, and I do this with TV programs as well, if it's quite clear that there's not going to be any problems, they get a nice reduced rate. If it's quite clear there's going to be problems, the author knows that anyway. And so we come up with a with an, a, an increased fixed fee rate, but I, but I always agree fixed fee. Sometimes I'll take a hit on it if a book I thought was going to be easy suddenly turns into a nightmare and it's happened. Sometimes it'll be all right when, sometimes I'll make a bit of money when the book isn't as bad as the author and I thought it was. Um, Yeah, that's how I've tried to change the legal landscape there is to give independent publishers the opportunity. It's still a a budget, you know, it's still a reasonably big line on their budget. I can't deny that. Can, Can you give us an indication? I mean, I know it's going to vary. I mean, yeah, anything between, uh, I've done, my books tend to be anything between 1,200 quid and 2,200 quid. Okay. Um, I, I've said to, I, through speaking with you and I said to Mark, you know, I'm happy, anybody who comes through this, I'm happy to offer discount to. Um, I, I get that it's still a reasonable chunk of money. Um, and I wouldn't say everybody should do it. What I'd say is if you've got concerns, it might be a good idea to do it. Yeah, and I think that's probably where most people will be in that if they think their book's benign and they've published three before, they're not going to come to you, but the book where they think there might be an issue. Um, although I have to say we're getting value out of this podcast because it's already given me some steers. I am serious about that. I think I am going to rename this, the REF station to something fictitious. It's just too risky to go ahead. And the story ultimately is about corruption. Well, um, it's totally right. <laughs> All it takes is one guy, at the, they meet up what, once a year at their club and they say to him, well, oh, I read this book about your, your base and I tell yeah. you what, pretty close to the boat. And that's all it takes for a claimant who probably has deep pockets to get a bee in his bonnet, tootle off to shillings or to Carter Rook or whatever, uh, yeah. and writing very, very scary letters. Uh, the other, the other defence of libel I always remember is that um, the person's dead. So that's the yeah. other thing to, to look into because you can't libel the dead. That's not changed, right? No, I mean, it's the one time I seem completely disgusting human being when I say, are they alive? And, <laughs> they go, and I go, great. Well, we're fine. <laughs> You've got no problem. Yes. Um, good. Well, I mean, it's a, it's, a more of, it's a fragmented media world. It's changed so dramatically in yes. 10 or 15 years. I think you're probably positioning yourself very nicely because in the old days you made a TV programme and you started at £45,000 for half an hour to sort of put a TV programme together. Today people are making TV for substantially less than that yeah. and they can't afford, as you say, the old expense regime. So I hope it's working out for you. What, what's the, how long have you been going? It's uh, three and a half years now, and I do that. I do the same service for TV companies. On my website, there's a what I I'm, what I'm different to a lot of pretty much all law firms is I I put my prices on my website and I I stick to them. There's a production company booklet. There's a publisher's booklet, and I do the same thing. I give uh, 
production companies a clean bill of health. They Some start me from the beginning and we work right our way through to broadcast. Some just send me the final edit and say, can you, can you tell us if there's any problems? And I, what I'm trying to do is, and you're absolutely right, there's, there's no central media anymore. I mean, some of my best clients are kids who've gone off and started a website and have just, it's blown up. They're, they're huge and they're doing incredibly well. The media world is so... Uh, it's so free. It's so easy. You know, and then another area of, uh, I'm looking into is YouTubers. You know, the amount of the amount of power these these kids have, and I don't think they realize the same thing I said at the beginning. Once they have the power, the the money, and that's when the complaints start to arrive. Yeah. Yes, I know. There's um the great YouTube example is the woman who unboxes Disney toys, and she makes twelve million dollars a year i think um just from videos of unboxing um, but people will be you're right when when money comes in and there was another example i remember of that which is the borat film um which i used to be able to remember the whole title of it which i think is called borat cultural learnings of america for make benefit glorious nation kazakhstan yeah. And they were, you know, for all the times we had, we had it drummed into us about release forms and getting the legals right, they threw everything out the window. I think they had a fake release form. Oh, which, this is the three guys in the van. Yeah, the three guys in the van and the, and the southern priest as well. So there were two scenes in the film. So we classified it when I was working with the BBFC, so I knew a bit about the background. So basically they, as far as I know, they either didn't do release forms or the release forms were also kind of satirical. They matched what it looked like they were doing. So they're signing a release form thinking this is a TV presenter from Kazakhstan. Uh, in actual fact, it was kind of semi-reality. He was a comedy character, but he used real people. And of course, the film, you know, had it died a death and no one known, knew anything about it, there probably wouldn't have been any legal problems. But it was a phenomenal success. I mean, it made millions of dollars. Inevitably, people who came out thinking that they were doing one thing and it turned out they were being having the mickey taken out of them, uh, came to them. Now, of course, they had a solution, uh, which I believe was to turn up and, with a checkbook. And those cases got settled pretty quickly. Yeah. Um, but I am not everyone's going to make that much money that suddenly they can write a big enough check to keep the people happy about yeah. it. And I'm sure there's probably a new church somewhere in Southern America where the, the priest um, worked. And the check they want is always five times more than it's actually worth. Yeah, of course. Well, the other thing I was going to say is a little bit of money spent in the first place is going to save you. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's, uh, the, you know, I, the problem is what I'm, I mean, you've got to remember, I, I, I might sound like a money-grabbing lawyer, but my, I'm an in-house lawyer by trade. I, I consider myself, like those BBC lawyers, I consider myself an in-house lawyer. There's a line on my website, like, it's like having an in-house lawyer. Um, I, I, I find I've not changed my mindset, maybe it will come in a few years. I find my mindset, I'm all I'm bothered about is getting the editorial out. Getting the editorial yeah. out, being involved from the beginning. Because when I'm involved from the beginning, I'm not the lawyer that ruins everything. I hate being the lawyer. Yeah. I, 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 I love working with journalists. I, I probably am frustrated journalist myself and um i hate being the guy in the room going oh that seems great but you've got to get rid of it or oh that line's great or oh that chapter's fantastic but god you've got to leave you've got to leave. i hate being that guy yeah but, but, more on film less on books but if i can be at the beginning and say this is how you approach this then i'm not the guy at the end saying <laughs> you're done yeah and the bbc lawyers were good like that and i i always felt they were enablers they wanted the they wanted the story to go out they wanted the documentary to be made and if if they knew that there was a risk there they were they found it an acceptable risk because you'd done your due diligence because you'd put the work in beforehand and they could see it in their legal mind how, how it would stack up as a defense um they weren't hugely thrilled the time i had to phone them to tell them that i'd got some names wrong they're live TV report when I was um, describing a notorious paedophile who had uh, done despicable things and was being put away for a very long time. And in the middle of the report, and I hadn't even realised I'd done it, instead of saying his name, I said the name of the chief superintendent oh. uh, from Cambridgeshire Police who'd uh, arrested him and heroically put this guy behind bars. And I had no idea I'd done it. I think a lot of people didn't notice, and I just got a phone call from the gallery afterwards saying we're pretty certain we've just checked the tape. So you described his name. Um, but, you know, sometimes that sounds like a training example of the worst possible thing you can do. But actually, it was so ridiculous. And he was the policeman yeah. who arrested him. It made no impact at all. And the policeman laughed it off. And I think the lawyers, I phoned, obviously had to phone them just to say this has happened. And they, they had the same opinion, said, 
it's too it's too obvious and too bonkers that that policeman is not ever going to say I'm obviously not a paedophile obviously he's not anyway it was just one of those things as a journalist <laughs> yeah <laughs> phew that was a that was a relief oh, well I clear the I clear every day the right stuff on, uh, I do the live oh I do, do you was that live yeah so how does day, that work uh, I just call the gallery and go apologise or correct <laughs> okay um, but yes, there's often times I'm sort of oh, throwing, I'm imagining myself throwing coffee all over myself when you claim that the... Yeah, <laughs> splurting everywhere. Right stuff, it's Matthew Wright, the tabloid journalist, yeah. and he has a few guests on OK, yeah, I'm with you now. Look at the Daily News, I'd say. OK, yeah, yeah, sorry, well, I didn't mean to... I've got an ex-colleague of mine from MTV who is now head of legal at the ITV who loves doing the Jeremy Kyle show. Yeah, I can only imagine it's quite exciting. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, of course. Then there's a topical news quiz on in the UK. Uh, not news quiz. Oh, yeah, it's a news quiz called um, Have I Got News For You? It's been long running and they often refer to the lawyer who I think sits in the front row, in, on, you know, in the studio even, yes. uh, and has to make those those big bucks decisions because they can potentially be very expensive yeah. if you get them wrong. Yes. Yeah, but I don't have to remind you that. Yeah, well, you know, you just have to rel- put yourself in... The, uh, you're, rely- you're relying on good journalists. I mean, Matthew Wright is a tabloid journalist, but he's a good journalist. He knows yeah. this. So. They're the best journalists, the tabloid journalists. You may not you may not like reading the writing, but I can tell you from, from having worked in the industry, writing up stories in a tabloid sense is much more challenging and difficult yeah. and skillful than being able to ramble on for ages in The Guardian or The Times. And when I was clearing the Independent and the Evening Stand, the Independent on Sunday, I've got to say the Evening Stand was the one I enjoyed working on. I mean, I, I guess I'm more of the, I, you know, I do a lot of celebrity. I do, I clear around 90 magazines at the moment. So I, I have celebrity magazines and lovely cooking magazines and the, the fun ones of the celebs and the, you know, the fast moving tabloid esque news type. Stuff. So, David, let me ask you a couple more questions that will bring us up bring us back on to sort of a useful advice, I think, for people in, in our position. Um, first of all, what happens when, and I guess this could happen to any of your clients, they stick their feet in the ground and say, we've heard your advice, we're going to go this way anyway. So an author might say, well, I don't, I don't take it as seriously as you do, I'm sticking with this. Where do they stand down the road? With all, I, all, uh, all I am and all I can ever be is an advisor, I, I, even to my clients, even when I was in-house, and trust lawyers to sort themselves out. All I ever am is saying, this is the legal position as I see it, and these are the risks as I see it. If somebody says, thank you for your advice, I don't want to follow it, what's the risks? I'm more than happy to put that to one side and say, okay, if you want to keep it, why don't we think about ways of minimizing the risk? Why don't we think about ways of, 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 of not letting that, either not letting that person know that it, it, them or thinking about obscuring facts or changing things just to minimize the risk rather than getting rid of it completely. Let's think about ways around it. And this is what I was saying. You know, I I want, I'd rather be a lawyer. Every lawyer could be a blank page lawyer. There's no legal risk in a blank page. I always want to get stuff out, but everybody's free to ignore their their lawyer's advice and say, you, you, you might think, and often I will say it's a legal risk but I just can't see that person complaining or I just can't see that yeah. this is a problem. And what you were talking about before with jurisdiction, especially with your American listeners is I could say, well, here's Bob Smith. If anybody in the UK knows him, you're done for. And I could have a, a word, a talk with the author and the author says, I'm pretty confident that nobody in the UK would know Bob Smith. I'm pretty confident his reputation in the UK is not going to be at risk. So I, I've been in many positions where I, I have an American, a clear American website where I say, you're fine for the US, might be a problem for the UK, uh, but I don't think anybody will sue you in the UK because I don't think they'll have the means to do it. And what about this passage that we see at the beginning of books and towards the end of fil- or at the end of the credits and films that goes on about any resemblance to any person living or dead is purely coincidental? Is that something yeah. we should be sticking in our books? Does that I help? Think, I think definitely. It's a, it's a great line for me to start any letter. And it's a great, it's a hard obstacle for the claimant to overcome. And there's a specific form of words we need to be using. I, I mean, I, I, use, I, I use maybe two or three versions of it, but you know what? As long as the reader understands the, what you're trying to put across, you won't be caught out by missing certain words or anything like that. Yeah. What's conveying to the, to the reader is that don't 
believe any of this is, is true. Okay, so David, you do this work in clearing uh, texts and, uh, and and pieces and so on. But do you also work in the copyright side of things? Is that your area at all? I, see, I've never been a, a, a private practice copyright lawyer, but I understand. I mean, I, I do advise on copyrights. That I, I advise what what would be and trademarks. You know, what would be a risk where you where and what I'm very good at is finding is spotting where complaints will come. And advising on the overarching defences you would have if you want to use it. And the new quotation defence is great. Um, this is in the UK. The, the, no, there's been no case law on it, but it looks like if you want to quote a, a poem or a passage and you, you properly um, you properly credit it, then you can start to, to get away with taking a little bit more than you, than you used to do. Okay. So you can quote, for instance, if you want to use some song lyrics uh, to set the tone or mood in your novel... Uh, in the past, you might have had to reach out to Chrysalis or somebody for permission. Do you think now there's some scope for quoting it? Yeah, or? I'd say the, it, the the prospects are looking good. Uh, there's been, like I said, there's been no case law for me to say definitively, but I, I think a lot of people, I know I have written back to quite a few people and said, sorry, this is, a, this is clearly a quotation and, and not heard anything. Yeah. And I think for most authors, when it comes to copyright, it's probably the other way around where they're concerned, particularly in this electronic ebook uh, world, they're concerned about their books appearing. And most successful authors, even moderately successful authors, authors are finding their books for sale on sites, um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, which are not owned by them. Yes. I mean, the, the, there is a, it's not a service I actually provide, which maybe I should be thinking about it, but you know, there, there are organizations that will, in fact, the law firm that part own me, Wigan, they um, ha, they also part own a company called Incopro that, that, that sweeps the web looking for copyright material and automatically start proceeding against people. Yeah, that's good. And I think somebody's brought that up in our Facebook group recently. recently. It sounds like the same service. So we'll check that for our discussion uh, with Mark after this interview and try and make sure people have got that link. Uh, and there's also, there's a fairly straightforward takedown notice, um, oh, which, which you can I, send, yeah. That I can give them that, that, that. I've got a blank, you know, it, it, it invariably works. The, the copyright, the notice and takedown actually works quite a lot. Once people know you, you've spotted it and you're onto it. But, you know, having worked in Hearst with Cosmopolitan brands like Cosmopolitan, you go like this, just filling yeah. another one sprouts up every time you put your finger in it. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's the Wild West. And unfortunately, and I'm talking to you about loving working with journalists, what I'm seeing is young, young kids coming into journalism where there's no scope to train them anymore. There's no money to train them anymore. And the, the concept of rights, intellectual property rights, is so far skewed to what you and I would imagine is the norm. They, they just have no concept of copyright, of ownership. Oh. They, they really, you know, I, somebody called Google Images a free Getty last week to me. Right. And, and that really sums up exactly what, where they're coming from. Yeah, that is a worry. And I think, I think, it's more important now than ever before for people to respect and understand IP. And it used to be, you're right, it used to be something that had nothing to do with us. It was companies dealt with it and we were at the, you know, it's very unlikely. But this day and age where everybody's doing a blog, everyone's making videos, everyone's doing podcasts, having respect for somebody else's IP, which is their living, yes. should be should be something that's um, uh, worked on, I think. Well, yeah. I can see that you're going to be doing that. Well, David, it's been fantastic talking to you. It's been, I mean, um, Obviously, it's a really interesting area. I think you and I could probably anorak about this for yeah, yeah <laughs> hours. <laughs> um, Once you get started. Yeah, but I've certainly, as an author, I have certainly had the cogs turning in my head and I'm thinking about my text uh, with a quasi-legal brain now. Um, and so that's been incredibly useful for me and I hope it has for other listeners as well. Yeah, I mean, what I'd say is don't, you know, don't necessarily go off and spend money on a lawyer. Just take a moment to sit down and not be you, not be the writer. Just try and be a quasi-lawyer and say, am I affecting anyone's life with this here? Yeah. And it's quite interesting. Uh, you, I mean, what I often do is write down the allegations that are being made and think about them in, in their uh, uh, standing alone rather than... The problem when you're writing is you're going, i made an allegation here, but that's fine because I'm thinking about this and that's fine because he did that. Sometimes it's good idea just to take yourself out of that and write down what you're actually saying context yeah yeah david just give us a, a recap of the website where people can find you oh i'm um, www.reviewedandcleared.com reviewed and cleared that's what you want to hear yes 
Hey, well, it was, it, it, I, I, you know, Calpera Vision, I took that from an old client um, clearance system. So it was either reviewed and cleared or reviewed and commented. And I thought maybe reviewed and commented didn't give the right message. Yeah. <laughs> Better than reviewed and rejected. Yeah. <laughs> So that was David Burgess, and as you mentioned at the end, reviewedandcleared.com is his place, uh, his home on the internet, if you want to go and have a look at that. And he's got a very good brochure, actually, and unlike most law firms, um, he sets out his prices because they're, they're um, uh, fixed prices, so you can see in this sort of PDF brochure what it is you're likely to pay for, how many pages that he looks at, and so on. Um, and that that's partly fits into exactly what he's trying to do, which is to make legal services accessible to an independent set of authors, which is it's noble and it's a it's a great thing, isn't it, Mark? Yeah, it's Dave's great. I've known him for years and years. Uh, we obviously worked together whilst when I was practicing as a lawyer. One thing I would say though is, as people come out of that interview with David, is is I don't want um, authors to think that they must now, as a matter of course, go to a lawyer and get their book and it could be non-fiction or it could be fiction they need to get that um, checked for for legal i would say what the best way to approach that interview is to listen to the practical advice that david gave and in particular to think about how other people might see themselves if they could identify themselves as a result of either being named in your book or being uh, referred to in a way that made identification possible and if uh, that kind of identification is possible, then think about how they would feel about the things that are being said about them. And if um, you then feel that it's something that's negative, they might be upset, then I would say it's worth just having a, th a thought about whether you might want to get that um, checked out or whether a, a simple changes might be uh, the, the most sensible way to proceed. So that's something that you've done with regards to, to your book, isn't it, James? Yeah, so I, my book, I wanted it to be authentic, and it's it's based in a real world, so I, I set it in a real RAF station, RAF Boscombe Down, not too far away from where you are, Mark, uh, which is where they do the test flying in the UK, sort of the equivalent to Edwards Air Force Base uh, in the US. But then I created a fictitious unit within it because there's corruption and, and, and so on within the uh, the storyline. So it's not the actual RAF test flying unit. It's called RAF test flying unit, actually, is what I called it, I think. Um, so that's not real. And the people who are the boss of that unit's not real. And the pilots there it can't be identified. However, in that interview with David, as you heard, it occurred to me, of course, RAF Boscombe Down had a station commander, had people on the front gate. Uh, who come into play at various points and it is possible that someone could identify themselves um, and I think taking on board what you've just said Mark I think in my case okay it's it's a minimal risk and it, it probably falls short of, of a, a risk of defamation but actually there's a kind of moral thing as well with you know I don't want to necessarily identify somebody it might cause them problems and it's almost worse for me that I haven't defamed them enough for them to sue me, but I've just made their lives a bit unhappy because they, you know, perhaps, you know, there might be some sensitivity about their time there, particularly as I involve aircraft crashes in my book. So I've changed it. It's now RAF Port, uh, West Porton, which is um, yep, yep, almost so, really. If you know, another, if you, you know the landscape around where you are. That's, that sounds like it could be an actual place there. It definitely does, yeah. So it's, yeah, I think you, you've been um, cautious. There's nothing wrong with being cautious. Um, and as you say, there is the, a legal and a moral situation. Um, I, I think you're being quite sensitive, um, which is fine. I, I am that, sensitive. You know, you're a very sensitive soul. So it's that wouldn't have bothered me particularly because I think the the risk of causing offence is, is also probably on the slim side. But authors are different. So, um, you know, if, if you feel that that's something that you can change without causing damage to your plot and your narrative and obviously just changing the name from Boscombe down to Port West Porton is 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 not going to have any effect whatsoever on um, your plot and, and most readers might think that there is such a place as, as West Porton or Porton West is absolutely um, is a good a good substitute so sensible perhaps in your case but just kind of I would just reiterate again it's for it, authors need to think about it carefully but don't be too alarmed by the prospect of, of getting sued what you don't want to do is is name someone and then um then uh, libel them 
that would obviously be a very bad idea. So just think about that test that David laid out. How would people react if they could be identified as a result of reading your book, fiction or non-fiction? And if it is something that you're concerned about after making that assessment, then it might be worth dropping someone like David a line just to, just to see what they think. Yeah, okay. I mean, the station commander in 1966 at RAF Bosquin Down will be knocking on 90 now if he's still alive. So that's the other thing I could go and check. <laughs> Which yes, and uh, and of course the dead can't see. So no. there's, um, there's that as well. That is one of the defences of libel. Um, okay, good. Well, I thought it was really interesting, and I love uh, the whole legal side of things. Uh, as a journalist, you get a lot of legal stuff drummed into you. And I, um, you know, some of the most memorable times I had were sitting in a court, uh, listening to legal debate, uh, particularly the moment of a verdict. And in it, inevitably, if I was there, it's obviously it was a fairly big, uh, high-profile court case. Um, and people's lives change on on the whim of a jury um oh i could tell you some stories about juries but uh, that would be illegal so good <laughs> thank you very much indeed I've, i really think this was quite a valuable podcast because um it just it it's a mindset thing that we don't normally it's somewhere we don't normally go the legal side of things but just to get you thinking about it we don't over complicate people's lives but it is something to be aware of and have in the back of your mind good we are going to be back with a fabulous interview next week i'm actually coming down to your part of the world i might even drop in on RAF west porton um, we're going to have an spf meetup and start planning um advertising for authors our next course launch which will be next year so uh, only a brief respite for us and we may even get to record the podcast together again we'll see if we've got time to do that good exciting times they are <laughs> what a time to be alive be <laughs> and you say you literally say nothing to that there's no repost. I'm falling asleep. I'm very you tired. Are. You are. You're barely <laughs> alive. Thank you for listening. We'll speak to you next week. You've been listening to the Self Publishing Formula podcast. Visit us at selfpublishingformula.com for more information, show notes, and links on today's topics. You can also sign up for our free video series on using Facebook ads to grow your mailing list. If you've enjoyed the show, please consider leaving us a review on iTunes. We'll see you next time.